time is by my watch 604 uh call to order the uh city of glenwood springs planning and zoning commission meeting for april 25th 2023 <clears throat> this is our regularly scheduled uh meeting it is available on zoom with passcode 177366 or via telephone 1-719-359-4580. Please call the roll. Commissioner Waller. Here. Commissioner Connerton. Here. Commissioner Shaver. Here. Commissioner White. Here. Commissioner Wissing. Here. Commissioner Sims. Commissioner Davey. Here. Commissioner Cowan. Here. And Commissioner Sipperly. Here. Great. Um, and we need to seat uh, the alternate April. Um, I'll entertain a motion on that. So moved. So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second um, and a voice vote. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Welcome, April. And I'd also like to welcome uh, Gregory Cowan and, and Matthew Sims, two new alternates to the commission. And look forward to working together. Um, and so item uh, three on the agenda is the uh, receipt of minutes from the January 24th, 2023 meeting. Um, I'd like to move to approve the minutes from January 24th, 2023. I'll second. Okay, I have a motion from Commissioner uh, Waller and a second from Commissioner Connerly on that. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll call for the vote. I don't have a plus or minus here. I don't know quite what I'm supposed to do, but I wasn't at the meeting. I was going to stay in anyway. So. Ah, there you go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. okay, and the vote is unanimous six to, to six to zero. Okay. Um, I'll open the floor now for comments from, from citizens appearing for <laughs> items that are not on the agenda. I don't see anyone here, but uh, is there anyone online that is wishing to say anything? I don't see any, so I will close the uh, public comment period and move on to new items. Uh, we have a comprehensive plan update uh, from Jim Hardcastle. Thank you. Hello. Got some new faces. Welcome. My name is Jim Hardcastle. I'm the Long Range Principal Planner, and we're here this evening to take a look at your new comprehensive plan update 2023 brief, the annotated or smaller condensed version document that will allow uh, those that use it occasionally and those that uh, have a chance to reference it uh not as often to be able to find what it is that they're looking for uh, let me get this up on the screen real quick there we go thanks thanks so if, if you have not had a chance to take a look at the document, <clears throat> it's organized in, in such a way 
that it gets you to what it is that you're looking at and fairly quickly. So the, I'll run through this with you. Uh, on the second page, you have uh, just a document that is different from the comprehensive plan that lets the user know how or where it fits into the overall design of the comprehensive plan itself, how this can be used. Not meant to replace it. It doesn't have all of the engagement, doesn't have all of the comments, uh, and it certainly doesn't have all of the narrative of all the different sections that uh, were designed to help support all of the strategies, goals, and policy action items. The first thing that you'll notice is that Glenwood character has been identified within a, a vast number of sections within the code. And if at any time uh, you are looking for those references about, for example, the third one down, sustainable tourism, you can look at any one of those seven pages and every single one of these page numbers are outside of strategies. They're not found within strategies or policy action items. It's all within the narrative, which helps build what it is that we did as we moved along and created that structure. The vision and goals are mostly carry over with a couple of additions, but they are the exact same. And, and all three of these are the exact same as what you will see in the comprehensive plan full version. The same with uh, the future land use map. Here for a reference to be used with uh, the designations that are listed on the next page which will give some reference to and some connection to uh, this whoa, stuff, the spatial uh, connections that all of the different land uses have within the city. And then we get to essentially on this page, the meat of it, uh, our policy action framework with the first example, a small uh, commentary about how it is to be used and it looks similar to what you'll see in the comp plan, but the, the wording is exactly the same. It looks different. I'm just going back and forth. You'll notice that uh, you have uh, numeration on the left side over here. You have uh, your strategies and then your policy action items in white. So strategies are colored with a page reference where you can find those within the overall plan but we didn't find a need to put pages on the, the action items as they are all listed there in connection with the strategies. And each one of those has a continuation, not on a different page, but at the bottom of the previous section, all color coded to the same color coding that you'll see in the comprehensive plan. Uh, and it wraps up at just under 17 pages. So it'll definitely be definitely be a used, more usable document. I envision using the brief on occasion, especially when I'm working with somebody at the counter or somebody who doesn't come in very often and just doesn't need to be uh, shown the entire document. You fan that, you're gonna blow them away. This will be a little bit easier, but if they want more information, I can just quickly pull up the full comp plan and share that with them. Uh, I did receive uh, some comments from uh, Commissioner Sipley, and if, if you wanted to go through those, we could do that. But if you have any other questions at this time, I'm, I'm, I'd love to take those. I don't actually have questions, and most of those uh, comments that I made were just semantics about moving words around within the phrases to read clearer. But I don't, at this point, since the main document has been approved, that might not be an option. It's a really you did a great job. Well, we all, we all spend a lot of time on it, all of us, everybody in the room. Uh, and it's my understanding that we can change those small errors. We can, we can make those where we find that something might make more sense to say it in a different way. We should change emergency services to those that respond. At, at this time, we can't really change the, those as, as I understand it. The, the, the essence of it is, is there. So it will remain, but if we have any errors, we can change those. <clears throat> and you, we are looking from you tonight to approve this document, uh, which it, this is the last point where it will 
uh, come to, and it will, won't move on to city council. They, they have asked for a couple of, of things such as the character, we put that in there, uh, but this, this is certainly the, the final spot for this to be approved. Great, thanks, Jim. I think that'll be a really um, user-friendly way to approach the comp plan. Um, anybody have comments, Amy? Just a quick question. This looks great, I love it. I went through the whole thing. I was wondering though, can you click on like a line to take you to the line or no? Or to the, is a plan embedded <clears throat> inside of this document somehow or no? So the, the comprehensive plan is uh -huh. set up to be linked so you can move throughout. Okay. This is not set up as such. Okay, it, I was just wondering if that was how it was. So. But I believe we have that ability with, with InDesign and our in-house specialist. Because if somebody wants to go deeper into one of these, you know, it would just be a simple click for them to go in deeper, I guess is what my only comment is. Otherwise I was gonna say, let's, let's go. So I'll, I'll address that a little bit. And, and this really is meant to be its own document. So if we linked it, it would be linking it to the much larger document. And this is meant to obviously list the page numbers of where you can go and find if you want to do that deeper dive, which I expect many of you sitting up there <laughs> will be doing. Yes. Um, Very soon. And so this is probably Major. not, this is like a quick reference, if you will, so you know where you're going and you can see the goals and things, but it, I don't believe we're actually going to link it to the larger document. The larger document does have links within itself to yeah. go to those specific things. So if you found something in this and you wanted to get all of the narrative behind it and everything else in the beautiful 256 pages of the full comprehensive plan, we welcome you to do so. I see. So this is just going to be more of a reference guide then, something easy like you were saying? Yes. Okay. I mean, I kind of, I was thinking it was going to link, so I was, <laughs> I was confused, but I do have the comprehensive plan as well. So I'm capable. Jordan, you have a comment? Um, yeah. So, so just to <laughs> clarify, it sounds like it's kind of like a table of contents almost on some, or a key, right? Sorry. The, looking at Hannah. The brief itself. Yeah, the brief. <clears throat> I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a table of contents. Uh, well, with, with the exception of you do have that page connection, yes, you could. Have or like a yeah key to the doctor. So um, my question was a little similar to Amy's. It, will there be a capability um, on the in the actual large document to like like the building code? We can search. There's a search um, function where you can search the code. Will there? I imagine that might be difficult because it's so wordy. Um, Hmm. And the, I'm, I just know I'm sure that, so I don't can, have I'm That's sure good. you can plug in a page number and you can skip to page numbers, but I really I use that search function a lot on the building code. And that's a that's a very good question, um, Joy. It's slightly different because this document is a PDF, okay. basically, and so our code is housed within a website called Muni Revs that interacts in that way. So okay. you can still do the handy control F. Um, right. And it, as I mentioned in the larger document, you know, it has the links that you were looking for to, to get you directly to um, skipping through the That's document something. itself. Yep. But the, the search function will work a little bit different than the municipal code. Okay. And then my only other comment was, um, I just was curious who wrote the Glenwood character statement. It just reads a little clunky to me. I don't know. That was just. It's a team effort. <laughs> I didn't know if like city council came up with the brilliant statement or what. Like, um, authentic really <laughs> clarifies. Um, I, I, I would just maybe say someone might want to, somebody that is really into grammar, maybe want to look at it. I don't know. You know, we looked at uh, a more expansive and, and blossomed approach to that, but I think when it comes right down to it, that was part of the problem when it comes to character. Right, right. How do you define it? Exactly. So yep. for us to say, 
here is what this section is all about. Yeah. We want to see what it is that we found in the open houses, the outreach, all of mm -hmm. the engagement strategies, uh, all of the different things that we did with the steering committee. Here is where it is in our comp plan. So I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think to keep it short, there was it seemingly in our best interest. <laughs> yeah. Seems like there's a dash that needs to be in there. And really Jim, semantics. I'm talking small. Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is directly from the approved document. Yes. So unless it was a error, which um, thank you, Commissioner Sipley, for sending those to us. Those are great. Then we wouldn't be able to change the wording because this document has been approved by city council. We're just looking at the makeup of this document to get your approval. Is this a good brief? Does it function for right. the intention that we have? Right. And it yeah. does. It's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and my question is on the Glenwood character as well, but it's not on the verbiage, but it's, it's, I mean, everything else is pretty global, you know, kind of high level. And then I look at Glenwood character and I go, oh, crap, you know, there's the, there's like 50 pages, you know, to go to, I mean, to, to explain it, which then seems very subjective. I mean, it, you know, it, it seems like, what does that really mean? Do I need to, I mean, to figure it out, and I'm not saying you do that, but 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 it's really the whole comp plan talks about Glenwood character. I mean, it, it's, you bet. Not, that, that's not totally correct, but if you look at all of these pages, it's pretty much the whole comp plan is where it's weaved in. And so so what, what my question is, is how did you come up with, you know, 50 pages or whatever? And, and, and if someone gets that and they're interested in that, then really they need to go to the comp plan and not... Sure. not be looking at this document because this doesn't really help no. you other than you need to read the comp plan if you yes must. you do this this starts the conversation though uh so we we used a combination of first creating the categories and then do, doing word searches to make sure that we found the actual places and then we read through it to find where it where it might actually be talking about it but not say sustainable tourism can we pull from that? Can we share those? And there are a number within there that you can. But to be clear, the users, all of us, uh, developers, uh, anybody doing research, writing a grant, if you're looking for the things that are, are listed here, you can start there. And then as you move around the sections that are uh, right. nearby, you'll find information that that makes your case, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, as, as I look at it, thinking from that perspective, you know, I might I might choose two out of social diversity, three out of sustain. You know, I mean, you know, as you kind of go through it, I mean, that's, and then you, anyway. And where is, where is this going to be housed? Again? This will be on the community development website under the planning department section under long range planning, uh, where the, the new compre comprehensive plan is already found. It will be just right below it. And also in our vision, Glenwood, I don't know how long we'll keep that up and running, but we, you'll have access to both of the, the comp plan documents. Uh, sorry, you'll have, you currently have access to the update in both of those places right now. Carolyn. Um, it, we've been wrestling with what Glenwood character is for years. It brings me back to what Sumner was trying to, to get at. And so I think even though the phrase might not be spot on, the list sort of covers all of our uh, all of our goals. Um, and I have used the uh, search function in the PDFs uh, pretty successfully. But one of my questions was about the page numbering because in the in the big comp plan, uh, you'll be in the PDF like page 17 and you're actually on page like 38 on the document because I think it was you know an open faced two pages per um, sheet or whatever. And I'm just wondering if that will be confusing as people go from this document back to the full comp plan to reference the page numbers. Uh, when was the last time you looked at that online? Probably January. Okay. After the approved uh, version was put online, I moved from the page, uh, from the, uh, the spread version to the page version. So it should line up now. It should. Okay. That's great. That'll solve some problems. It might be off by a page or two if, if the table of contents isn't labeled page one, right. the next one is one, it might be one, two. Okay. That's it for me. Thanks. 
Okay, well, <clears throat> you know, when thinking about character, I think that is something that you could get 20 different opinions if you ask 20 different people. And it, it doesn't surprise me that there's however many page numbers referencing that because it's such a difficult thing to try to define. But I wanna thank you and, and the staff. I think it's an remarkable what you've done. And I think one of the things I think is really outstanding is the efforts that were made to elicit comments and input from the public. I think if there's anybody that's complaining that they didn't have a chance, they weren't paying attention because you guys did a great job getting it out there and bringing people in and getting them involved and covering everybody in the community. So thank you for that. I think it was remarkable and commendable. So if we have no more to Joy. I just have one more comment. Um, the only item that struck me as a little weird when I was reading through it was under uh, 4.6, or sorry, I'm sorry, 4.5a, just that, um, that that was how that item led off that we were considering paid parking that for some reason did not seem like promoting pedestrian friendly and safe. Like that sounded like a smaller action item that the city's considering not overarching, I guess is what I'd say. That was the only other thing that came up when I was reading this. Um, I'll make a motion to approve. I mean, is this what you're looking for, Jim? Yes, sir. I'll make a motion to yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I thought that's what you said. Okay. Yeah. I'll I'll make a motion to approve the comp plan update 2023 brief to the comp plan update 2023. I will so second. Okay. We have a uh, motion from Commissioner Waller and a second from Commissioner White. Do we have Further comments, discussion? Okay, I'll call for the question. Hmm, thanks. So is unanimous seven to zero. Okay, great. Great, thank you. All of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I missed the brain. I don't miss the brain. No, I want to actually better. It's actually better. It's a better person. Yeah. 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 That one's yours. Ready to do some things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And then, and then you look like, 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 like,
Oh, well, because I kicked you off. Um, Listen, I made, I made the mistake with the comic theater thing because I didn't know, like, in the beginning, I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Oh, God. I don't work uh, in GDF. But that's all I work in. If it ever permits you, no. So, Mary, are you Yep. All right. Are we ready? Ready. Okay. Um, new item B, land use quasi-judicial -ju hearings training. And Richard is here to fill us in. Hi, good evening. Um, Richard Peterson Creamer, Carp New Handling Law Firm, Assistant City Attorney. Um, I, uh, I had a slide deck that we use for trainings. I think the gentleman just saw it last week or the week before. Thank you. Um, I was looking through these slides earlier that were in your packet, and honestly, it's better. So just pretend that I'm Sam Light, um, the insurance attorney. And um, yeah. no, it's, uh, this is a presentation that was uh, done at the Colorado Municipal League uh, conference last year. Uh, and it's actually online if you want to watch an hour and a half of, um, of this. And I will do my best um, to keep this to about five minutes. Um, what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, and I, I really am hoping that folks who've been on PNZ um, for a little while now have, you know, have had the experience of going through a couple of quasi-judicial proceedings to, to ask some questions with your experiences or share some experiences that you've, you've had, because I think it is, it can kind of be a hard thing to, to grasp um, until you've gone through it. Um, you know, the Planning Commission is a, I think as you all know, is mostly a recommending body. Um, you know, it's, its limited role is under, um, under the land use code and uh, doing subdivisions. And these decisions that uh, Planning Commission takes up can be, or, or I guess you can break them out into the Planning Department. Um, Hannah and staff, uh, spend a lot of time making administrative determinations. Occasionally, those come to you through a call-up or um, appeal procedure, um, and then those typically turn into a quasi-judicial decision. So we're not going to talk about administrative determinations. It's basically everything that doesn't come to P and Z. Um, then legislative decisions are, um, let's see. Legislative decisions are, the two most common ones are text amendment recommendations. So when, if we put a draft ordinance in front of you um, to amend the code, amend uh, Title 070, that's legislative. And um, there's basically no rules uh, in the legislative proceedings aside from uh, the conflict of interest uh, provisions. And so with these, um, Text amendments and then also annexations are um, are legislative and kind of broad scale zoning changes are are legislative. So everything within that category, you can speak openly within the community. You can talk among yourselves privately. You can go, um, you know, go to open houses. You know, it, it's really kind of your personal decision um, how much you want to be engaged in it. Um, but the only remedy for somebody who opposes a legislative decision is uh, to do a referendum, which would repeal uh, the ordinance that, uh, that adopted that legislative decision. Um, and so, you know, it's not something that we as the city attorney worry too much about um, in terms of conduct. Conflicts of interest, as I said, is the one, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, the one area that, um, you know, that we still very much uh, encourage full disclosure um, of conflicts and uh, recusal from proceedings. Um, Quasi-judicial decisions are kind of the, yes, Pete? Um, could, could you give a couple um, examples of, of legislative ones that you've done maybe in the past year or two, you know? You know? Um, I mean, have we? Would it be the yeah. 
the code change is where we wanted to have commercial on the lower level and residential in those certain areas downtown would that be considered? that one's not a great example because <laughs> well because some some zoning decisions can become quasi-judicial if they are specific to a small number or a single property um, i think more like the housing code um, inclusionary housing code amendments that is kind of your classic um, generally the the term is is generally applicable laws um, and so uh, yeah updating sign standards um, what other text amendments have we done you got it but it's not i mean you know because i mean when i read these when i read these things if we can talk to people it sounds like ah, they get smacked in the face by hand or <laughs> get in trouble you know i mean because I mean that's that's so against most things that we do from I guess developments. I mean that's the kind of stuff that I think which those are not. Yeah, I had fallen. I had no idea we were allowed to talk about things like that with the public or research yeah. them ourselves. Yeah, I mean the hard one is annexation um, because oftentimes the annexations do come through with an entitlement. Um, so, given experiences we've had with annexations, um, it's something you probably want to ask us for advice about before you might participate in it. But you know, tr traditionally, some of the annexations that happen were just like, oh, you have water rights and a bunch of land and you want to come into the city, like, that's fine. Um, you know, some of the more complex kind of infill annexations would probably still be subject to quasi-judicial constraints. So anything about administrative or legislative decisions at this point? So quasi-judicial uh, decisions, you know, it's kind of the, the meat of this presentation. Um, these are things like conditional use permits, um, variances, PUDs, any type of specific, like site-specific um, land, land development plan that comes before you. Um, and then also those types of decisions that Hannah or the Community Development Department have made uh, for a site-specific approval that has been appealed or called up. Those are typically going to be um, under the, the quasi-judicial framework. And here, because of you know constitutional principles of due process and you know you can't deprive uh, property deprive people of property without due process of law. Um, and so due process in this context means um, a public hearing, um, the ability for uh, the public to, to engage, public notice, and then a, a fair kind of trial in front of the planning commission and city council. Um, and so, you know, the staff reports that go along with quasi-judicial decisions will uh, probably notice are oftentimes quite lengthy and include a lot of findings in them. And that's because staff will copiously go through the code uh, and figure out what uh, provisions are applicable, you know, what, what standards are going to be applied to this decision um, and make recommendations uh, for planning commission and city council to consider um, in making their decisions. And these um, these recommendations are often listed out as findings um, that, you know, we just talked about the comp plan. The comp plan is kind of the best place uh, substantively, factually to base these findings um, because that is kind of the guiding document for future development of the city. And so the reason for these lengthy staff reports is to kind of keep the debate um, the discussion around these decisions within within a framework that um, you know either the applicant if they're denied or the public um, if it's approved and they oppose uh, won't be able to have it overturned in court uh, and that's really what we're trying to avoid we're not we're not trying to you know have a certain outcome and and the the court reviews of these decisions are not um, generally are not substantive based on like planning principles or anything they're just trying to make sure that that due process has been followed and that's kind of the important 
piece of, of quasi-judicial kind of guidance that we give you. Um, so. Are we saving questions to the end? No, you can popcorn me. What do you got? <laughs> So um, one of the challenges I feel like we always face on PNZ as commissioners is we have this beautiful table that Hannah has traditionally provided us that shows that the application meets all the building standards. And yet we may feel that it doesn't, it's not concurrent with our comp plan or our vision for our Glenwood Springs. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, how do we use the comp plan effectively to kind of back up our opinion that that, that 50 pages of Glenwood character would probably be good. We, I mean, one could cut. Yeah. I mean, Extrapolate. That, that's, that is, you know, there is enough in the comp plan to, I think, substantiate, um, you know, any, any decision standards, approval standards that include character, which is probably most of them, um, you can, you can root it, root that in the comp plan. And um, so, and so remind me how many we need to, how many do we need to cite when we're denying an application? What do you mean? How many? Like, um, if if in that scenario they met all the building building code, but we all we have to cite is one part of the comp plan, or what would you recommend from a legal I mean, standpoint? It's a case by case, and it yeah. depends on the application. Like variances, you know, you have to hit every single right. standard. Others are not quite as as stringent. Um, right. So that's why that's why I'm here. I, you know. I, I don't have the code memorized as well as Hannah does. Right. Maybe she has a <laughs> better sense, but um, yeah, it's really going to be a case by case basis. Okay. And you know, that's when we can kind of step back and help you guys work through a motion. If it's not going to be the staff recommended um, motion and findings, then we, we will take time. Um, but I can I can get to that in a minute when we talk about like deliberations um, because that is a, an important piece of this. But pre pre hearing um, is probably one of the areas that make us most anxious because we can't control you, and um, you know social media has become a a real problem for local government officials. I'm just going to be blunt about it. I'm not saying in this community um, or pick out any specific community but broadly um it's 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 been a challenge and people post opinions about uh things of importance to their community uh without realizing that it's um going to be in front of them as a quasi-judicial judge in the process so um if there's any question about whether something is going to be in front of you or is quasi-judicial, um, we're here to help um, before any public statements are made. Um, and then, you know, that extends to like, don't go to open houses, don't go to charrettes, um, you know, and sometimes, you know, there is this weird purgatory period where, you know, we know an application's coming in, but sometimes the developer will hold it back a couple of weeks and try to get some PNZ and city council members to like go do a site visit or something. Um, my guidance for that, um, you know, they will argue, oh, we don't have an, a pending application. You can still uh, do all these things. Our guidance for that is, of course, going to be just be conservative and don't do it um, because that, that could still come up in court um, as something that biased you um, in your decision. See, I have questions coming. So that well, that was one guidance we had. We have, and I know I'm probably one of the guilty ones sometimes. But was, <laughs> is is that when staff comes out with projects, and you know, it's just, we live in our small town, and <clears throat> you drive by, and you know, most mostly you know the properties and that sort of thing. But so that I mean, that was an interesting thing. I think 
maybe it was you or Carl yelled at us. I forget, but uh, there were that that um, even even that's not supposed to happen. Is that right? I mean, yeah. Even, and if I it mean, does happen, if, then like just put it in the record um, and and say it it did not influence my uh, opinion at all. Well, and I, I guess what my my and I I guess my question is, you know, I'm not going with uh, a representative from the development team or anything like that. Yeah. I'm just I'm just trying to understand maybe further the the staff report, um, that sort of thing. But but I guess I need to be only read the staff report. Like if I'm getting a place on Airbnb, you know, you, you can't go look at it or you have to just, so I just went through one of those. I mean, you, you, I mean, you're stuck with, here's what the paper says and these are the rules. And I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of what it is. Just the staff yeah, and, report. And like, we know, we know it happens, but like, it, you know, if there's, if there's something that you really, as a commission feel like you need to look at, we can go do site visits. Yeah. Um, but that, that requires planning and notice and, yeah. um, and everything. So yeah, I understand the temptation. I, I go do it, but I'm not subject to the same rules. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, a question yeah. about, about two things that are sort of going on right now and stop me if we're not allowed to talk about them, but I got <laughs> a postcard in the mail and saying you know we're going to be reviewing the design standards for downtown mm -hmm. now obviously if something changes we're probably going to know about that but would that be something we're not supposed to participate in and i mean it's a community listening session so yeah don't uh well that that one i would still say you know it's going to be before you so like i i think not attending those is probably the best um my my guidance um especially because the design the downtown design standards are probably legislative but there's some case law that that it can be quasi-judicial um you know typically for quasi-judicial if you're in the notice area um we we oftentimes will ask you to refuse um, mm -hmm. because it that could affect a pecuniary interest um, that you have in your in the property value right but people were invited to this who don't just live downtown that's for the whole it's for the whole city I, I, yeah <laughs> or i don't check my mail the notice the notice for that was sent out to specific um property owners but it is open to the entire public for comment mm -hmm. that's that's Huh. Well, I got one. <laughs> not on that list. Let, let me rephrase that. That's a geographic area that that gets sent out to. Yeah, my, you know, my guidance is, is typically going to be to, to not attend those. Um, but, you know, that, that one is probably legislative. I can't remember how big is that. The, scope of that it's, it's up for good. debate what's that up i for said debate. that's up right, for right, debate right. yeah it's probably okay and you might just be going to city council now right or is it coming here it would still need um the code amendment if it changes from what was originally so it's possible that it comes back to pnc yeah, yeah. i can i can follow up with you guys and then maybe for our new members, because I got sort of blindsided by the A and B bank mm -hmm. conversation. I didn't realize at first that we, you know, had to keep away from those things. Yeah, yeah. And folks are talking about Safeway. And my comment is, you know, I'm going to see this later, so I can't really have a conversation. All I have done is say commercial can also mean grocery store. So that <laughs> level is okay. <laughs> I prefer to no comment. Okay. Um, I think in our communications, you can always forward public inquiries to the community right. development department, mm -hmm. as yeah. we have a little bit more liberty to talk about it with whoever's interested with their questions. Okay. And the, and those, you know, if you receive any communications from people, um, even if you don't respond uh, on a quasi judicial matter, please forward them to Hannah, um, because those need to be in the record. It's the sort of thing if that comes out later uh, during the court proceeding, then it could make it look like you had bias, even if you didn't. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so a lot of a lot of the process is is just disclosing anything um, that you've done or seen or heard um, in the record. Okay. 
right. But we can tell people that we run into show up to the plan, you know, show up to the planning and zoning meeting. Yeah, I think yeah. encouraging people to to show up yep. and engage in yeah the public discourse is totally fine. I've got a question that um, was personal to me <clears throat> when they were talking about the um, um, setbacks from the river. And uh, I was told that I couldn't participate because I had been noticed. Mm -hmm. um, but then I know the uh, council member in my district, he didn't recuse himself. He, and that's a little different scenario, I think, is it not? Or it, yeah, I mean, that is, that is a generally applicable zoning uh, change, but it, you know, if your property specifically is affected, um, I would definitely say recuse. Um, Which is what I did, but I regret it because I think I had a lot to offer to the conversation. Yeah, know, and going you know, down the road. But one of the things that can come up is if you're a property owner, can you and you're recusing, can you get up and then testify as a member of the public? Um, and I think that can cut either way. Like there there's no rule saying you can't um so that is just a, announce yourself as a member of the public and right providing um, input i mean you cannot you you cannot um as a member of this board under the glenwood ethics code you cannot uh represent an applicant um and that'll happen in smaller towns you don't have that bar because like everybody on p and z is like they're the architects and like for the whole town um so it's like they're in front of p and z all the time um so you can't do that but but if you're recused and offering public comment you know i think that's something we would take on a case-by-case -case basis um especially in a legislative setting so in that in that scenario why was the councilman not asked to recuse himself i i was not oh, okay. working with glenwood at that, at that point good answer <laughs> <laughs> i think that's He's good. <laughs> I'm not going to ask. Um, I think I've lost my screen. I don't know what's going on. I was kicked out. Um, so yeah, don't make up your mind. Let's see if I can share my screen. Again. It is frustrating. You're no longer a member of the public. <laughs> So, so could you could you say I'm going to recuse myself and, and because I feel strong that something's happening next door to me, so I want to be in the public versus sitting on PNC and an alternate takes your place. Um, you should definitely recuse yourself. Whether you offer public comment is something we would want to discuss. But well, I'm well. I'm just asking. I mean, let's say I something. I had I had a big deal that this is very important to me. I think I have good um, input to give. Could I sit on that side and and not and not be here and 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 participate for as 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 another part of the process? I, I yeah I think it I think it is possible. Um, I think we would still want to talk about it with you just to make sure like we're protecting the city like cause that's. That's always our, that is our number one goal. We might care more than some others about some things. So yeah, no pro or con petitions. Don't make up your mind. Don't do your own research. Um, and, and this goes to, you know, we're getting into kind of the, the conduct during the hearing a little bit. Um, with public commenters, especially, um, you don't want to get into a back and forth with them. And because oftentimes that'll show that you have some preconceived notion of how you're going to vote. Um, my my strong advice, and, and you guys are really good at this, is to just take public comment. Um, and then you give the applicant uh, a chance to respond um, and maybe have a few more questions for the applicant and then uh, 
bring it back to, to the commission to, to deliberate. That is, that is definitely the best uh, way procedurally, why, procedure wise to uh, not have opinions being offered until all of the information has been presented to the commission. Because that, that's really kind of the point of that is you don't want to show that you've made up your mind somehow before public comment is closed or the applicant has had a, an opportunity to respond. Um, this is all stuff we've gone through. Um, yeah, you know, I think consider the packet materials kind of a script, um, the findings especially. Um, you know, we we had we include recommended motions. We include a recommended motion for denial now, um, and but that's something that oftentimes will, or maybe not recommended for denial. Rec recommended a recommendation that's different than the staff recommendation. Um, that's something that we would need to work on typically, like in in the deliberation portion of the hearing. Um. just went through this. Yeah, try to avoid freewheeling back and forth. Um, again, you guys are really good at this, not doing that. Um, something something that comes up, with, and I haven't seen it come up too much here, but if a member of the public wants to get up and speak again, I, I generally advise not to let them. Um, <laughs> But I know it's really hard socially <laughs> and, you know, as a member of the community to, um, to tell people not to. But so, you know, it, it, that's the way we, we can make sure everyone has three minutes and that's it. They all have an equal amount. So, and I know you've probably seen it sometimes like, you know, Jim would say, okay, I'm, I'm going to give my time to this guy over here. And pooling. now they get, yeah, they're, they're pool. I mean, I've heard that a few times. So is no pooling allowed? I don't, do we have a pooling rule? I mean, that varies town to town. I think the mayor has decided before to allow it, but on a case by case basis. I mean, that's the thing. You can always, you guys can always make up the rule as you go. Um, oh. It's <laughs> not these rules. Go back to that. <laughs> George is our mayor. You're talking, George. Rob. Are you? You're talking <laughs> Robert's rules. It's not Robert. We, we uh, follow Bob's rules. I was. I, I'm going to send the Bob's rules to okay. you guys. The CML, CML attorney came up with them. They're like 30 pages long instead of 600, um, and they're much more practical for local government use. I've read them. I think it's interesting because uh, most of us. Well, you you guys were, Carolyn. You were on before COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I came on during COVID. So I haven't bit, had a big in-person um, hearing yet. So it'll just... Well, we have one, right? I remember Which one? A, Donovan? a few. Yeah. But that was that was not in person. Right. Remember a few where we, um, we did allow yeah. people to pool their minutes and someone was like the speaker for the whole neighborhood. I think that happened during the river discussion as well. It, it can be efficient, but then you, I've also in other towns, I've had um, people who aren't in attendance then try to pull their time because, you know, they'll say, oh, I have to stay home with my kids. Um, so blah, blah, blah is representing me and that person gets like, 25 minutes or something, which is just not okay. It's not, it's, it's not written somewhere to say everybody gets like, if you go to the school board and you talk before them, you've got three minutes, that's it. You're not pulling anybody. I mean, our, our rule is three minutes, Okay, but they, there's they, no pooling. At I, any other I don't minutes. think we have a rule about pooling, but you know, okay. it's the sort of thing if the chair or the commission Happens. ad hoc could say, Oh, let's do this. I, it it makes me uncomfortable, generally. In a way, it's but, better but it, than hearing the same thing twenty times. In exactly, it can be more efficient. <laughs> yeah, because one of the one of the pieces of advice is to you know once when, when comment starts getting repetitious, 
um, it's just not helpful. Um, so trying to avoid repetitious comment is a one of the one of the things we try to do. Stick with three minutes if you can. All right, let me see if I, I keep getting kicked off of Zoom. I don't know what I did. Okay. <laughs> do, you, do you feel like it's ever beneficial to ask? I guess it would be kind of like a rhetorical question, something that maybe you found in the staff report that you think is helpful for the general public to hear. Do you th ever think- You'd be asked. Asking the staff member the question. Yes. Right. It, like it seems like it's a good piece of information that everyone should hear. So you ask it just as a kind of a rhetorical, like you know the answer, but people yeah, should hear I mean, this. It, it could be more appropriate for the deliberations phase to be like, oh, look here in the, in the staff report, this is what this says. And, and then you could say, Hannah, could you clarify that or something? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, before the, the hearing, the public hearing, public comment section is closed, I, I definitely don't want you sharing your opinion, no, even if you have one. You're, we, we understand that it happens. Um, <laughs> you need to keep that to yourself. <laughs> Still after public comment. Yep. Yeah, and then and then you can start saying this is how I feel, and and that's even helpful. That's helpful as findings, you know, to to actually show that you deliberated and you are grappling with the substance of what's been presented and what the code says. Um, more deliberations are better, as long as you don't say uh, I don't I don't like something that is irrelevant mm -hmm. uh, and not in the code. I feel like we traditionally don't treat that as a deliberation. We typically make comments and that's kind of it. It's nice to know that it is encouraged. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't get into debates. But, no, of course yeah. not. But to, to banter about it a little more so than yeah. just these are my comments about it. Yeah, I think you can have some prepared remarks, but then I think also showing that you're really grappling with mm -hmm. what the what the decision is is good. And I think that's that's where we where we're happy that we have you. That if that that if one of us starts going off and you go, wait, hold that for mm -hmm. a later time. And I think that's greatly appreciated. Yeah. You know, whether it's from you or Han or whomever. Even though we might start. <laughs> no, but no, but that's a good thing because it's easy to get caught up. So explaining oh, yeah. the difference to me between comments and questions. <laughs> <laughs> that's your job. Um, one of the big things that will almost certainly get you recused and maybe your decision overturned is ex parte communications. Um, I think I kind of hit on this earlier with if you receive an email for it. Um, any communications try to disclose um, in the hearing record. Um, definitely don't don't talk to the applicant about the the case. Um, yeah, this is kind of the stuff that we went over earlier. Um, there's a good script you can use. Um, So um, yeah, I think that's quasi judicial for the most part. Hannah, did you have anything you wanted to hit on? Um, here's a piece about deliberations. So yes, please deliberate. Um, that's funny. And we shouldn't even be asking staff specific questions about applications. Like if something gets continued and we are puzzling over it, we should not be following up with outside questions of, to staff. Outside of the hearing? Correct. Um, I think it's okay to submit questions and you will not get answered until the hearing. Okay. It was explained to me one time that all of us need to have the same information. That's why you can't go visit the site because there might be a big old mud puddle when George visits and it's a sunny, bright day when I visit and we might form different opinions on the same thing. Mm -hmm. So doing the there and bring it forward 
seems to be valuable information. Maybe you'd have to take a picture of said puddle and share it with everyone. <laughs> record. And, and I think um, thanks for bringing up that question, Joy, because if you've ever received an email from me, I'm not trying to be evasive and not answering your questions. Usually I'll mention something like that's a great question and I'll bring it to you on Tuesday. So I try and make sure that all of you have my answer all at once and at the same time. And sometimes that will come out in an email, depending on what we're dealing with, but you'll all get it so that what I'm answering to one of you, you all have. Um, so yeah, then finishing up the hearing, uh, as I said, if you need help with the motion, ask me, or we might just, um, interject and help you. Um, and also with findings, like those are, those are going to be the, uh, kind of the two big things that, that a judge, a real judge will look at. Um, So, you know, this is this is to scare you, I guess. Um, the the most common way that um, land use decisions are appealed is uh, called a Rule 106 action. Um, these are state court claims. And basically it is a an appeal of the record um, that went to the planning commission and the city council. And what, you know, the, the brief, there's no trial um, in these proceedings. It's entirely done on the briefs. Uh, the city would produce the record, which is usually, if something's gonna be litigated, the record's probably a couple thousand pages. Um, and, and then, you know, the attorneys argue over, this didn't meet that standard. This was a violation of due process. Um, and it's it's really the due process issues that will get a, a decision overturned. If you're just quibbling over an area that um, is arguably within the commission's discretion, um, such as character, then uh, as long as your process was good, the judge is probably going to uphold your decision. Um, even if, you know, sometimes the judge will come out and say, yeah, I kind of disagree with this other decision they made, but you know, the, the commission is owed deference here. So um, you're, you're upheld. Um, Can we personally be sued? No. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't, don't defame people. Um, <laughs> yeah, geez. I have a quick question. You, you so can be named in your official capacity. That, that happens, um, but planning commissioners typically are a level lower, um, and so you know it would anything that gets to a court is going to go through the city council as well, and and honestly, like the city council's record is going to be the one that's going to be reviewed in much more detail than the planning commissions. Um, so. It's a uh, hypothetical. No, I'm just kidding. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> like hypothetically, if I, I mean, no, um, if there's uh, you're in another county or you're, you know, commenting on a, the exact, almost the exact same thing, like say in the land use thing or something in another county or another city um, as a private citizen, just say you're somehow relate, you know, you've got some relation there and you make comments um which would i don't know how to say it but like something that was happening here there was like a lot of similarities let's just say would does that i mean i know this seems silly but this i've seen this and with other commissioners from different counties <laughs> commenting um i think it's probably okay yeah. um okay. you know getting like I'm thinking about it as like in a, in a 106 appeal, getting that, getting your comments from another county into the record, would, like could be hard, like just pragmatically. Um, and for the record, I've never done that, but I just I, <laughs> no, I could I could see it happen. So. <laughs> but I know someone. Um, I think that's it for this one. And I, I did want to just go through um, the city. Can I get left back in a Zoom? Thanks. 
Um, I did want to go through the city's um, ethics code real quick. This is the one you guys have probably already seen previously. Um, this is the conflicts of interest code. Um, and I think it's it's just something to to be familiar with with where it is. You know, certain things just require disclosure, other things just require recusal. Um, you know, disclosure can just be like, hey, I'm an acquaintance of the of the applicant. Mm -hmm. um, recusal is if you is this definition of substantial interest um, at the bottom of the screen that's blow it up if that's helpful. Um, but the 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 the, the important term is is pecuniary interest, which is, you know, is basically a financial interest that could be affected. Um, and so that could be you live in the notice area, you have a business in the notice area. Um, you know, those are those are kind of the two big ones. Or you, you know, obviously if you have family member or, or affiliated with a business that is an applicant um, before the or before the commission that those are areas that you need to recuse yourself we have had in the past members of our commission bring applications before us and of course we heard them this happened a few times marco brought one and ben west brought one so clearly we can't all recuse ourselves because we sort of work with the other commission oh yeah totally <laughs> No, no, and that and that's not a, that's not where you would have to recuse. I think it, we could just make a blanket disclosure. Like Ben West is a member of this of this body, and we all know him and admire him, and we are going to make a fair judgment today. Um, you know, these are you know for for any of these hearings, it, it's I don't know if it's in the script, but it could be something you'd add. It's just a conflicts uh, disclosure say does anybody have a conflict of interest um, just a good reminder before the hearing starts um i have a question and uh, when i first started i know i was trying to figure out what are the rules and all that stuff and i talked with marco and blah 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 got some stuff which may not be correct but but um, one of the items that i had heard was that if if we're just talking to one other commissioner it's not a meeting but if it's three, if there's three of you, then it's a meeting and it needs to be noticed. So you can't do that. But like, let's say I was talking to Joy about something. I mean, you know, that's coming up is, I mean, it should be, I mean, it, it you, you talked earlier about, um, you know, not trying to influence somebody or that sort of thing. So how or, does that, how, how does that play out? So you hit on two things. Um, I'll take the second one first, which is if it's a legislative matter that's coming in front of you, you can talk about it. Um, right. That, you know, there's there's no rules. You can lobby each other, um, but not three of you, because then that's a meeting and it needs to be publicly noticed under the open meetings law. Um, and that also goes for text messages, emails, um, any of those could become open meetings law violations. Um, and something to remember is also any communications you have about uh, official city business can, can be subject to uh, an Open Records Act request, regardless of whether a meeting was held inadvertently or not. Um, so, you know, just always think twice about putting stuff in, um, in writing. Uh, either to staff or to each other um, about official city business. Clearly someone was pulling my leg saying that if we get out of these meetings by eight, we all go to the bar. Correct. Because we'd have to public notice that. No. We just can't talk about it, the city business. So we can. Oh, no. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> your leg. I thought someone. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. Nobody was pulling your leg. We are allowed to go out and have a beer. Yeah. Yes, um, the city pays for it. we cannot. <laughs> just check it on there. We cannot talk about um, about city business, especially about land use matters. 
And, and just as an addition, you guys are planning and zoning commission, but all of our other commissions, housing commission, transportation commission, whenever any of them are going to meet up with three and discuss a topic is when we notice it. But we fully expect for you guys to run into each other. And as long as you're not discussing city business or P&Z business or whatever your commission is about, that's okay. So you can go out for beverages and dinner and that's fine. Right, I was I was kind of asking because um, of the, the downtown overlay thing that's come up. Um, I noticed that and I said, oh, Emery, the other commissioners on Historic Preservation Commission might be interested in you know, seeing what the city's idea is. And he said, all right, let me know if you're gonna go because if there's more than two of you at the one meeting, it has yeah. to be public noticed. Yeah. So I'm not sure he knew that we were sort of being suggested to not attend. And I, I think he was probably thinking it, of it more in terms of historic preservation, which we would, by all means, notice for them to attend. But since you are on P&Z as well, um, it makes it a little bit different since you'll, you'd be discussing the item later here. Okay. But the HPC should still go to that but it might need public notice. I mean, I guess we don't, I don't need to know here what that commission's uh, rules are, but are they the same more or less for all commissions? Yes. Okay. Yes, mistakes happen too. I've been sitting in a room and suddenly I'm like, oh, this is an open meeting. So that would, that would apply if it were on Zoom yes. as well. Phone calls. Yeah. <clears throat> AOL instant messages. <laughs> and, oh. and Carolyn, to your question, for that aspect, it is fairly easy for staff to notice it if we have a situation like that. Um, so it's for, 24 hours. right, it's 24 hours. We post it down here. Our city clerk manages it. And it's a very small blurb that says two or more historic preservation commissioners may attend. And we say the meeting date, the time, and what the discussion is. And then it's posted. So it's fairly easy to take care of that once we know about it. Yeah, those don't have to go in the newspaper. The newspaper is used for like agenda items. So Richard, I am a big proponent of home ownership, but I also benefit from it as it's my career. <laughs> uh, how does that, I mean, obviously I, I'm working on a commission that is, Pro development. Um, how does that play out? I mean, it doesn't, right? You're not going to recuse yourself. I mean, no. It's the sort of thing that you could see in a, you know, in a 106 action, the opposing attorney going after you, like statements that you make. So just be careful um, would be my advice. Um, you know, the, it's all fair game in court. Like they can they can say you're a realtor and you're biased because of that. But if you, through your conduct and that, that's shown in the record, um, show that you're being fair and impartial, then that argument won't hold any water. So that's what we're trying to, what we're trying to get to. Any so questions? during deliberation, um, what should be the standard or the motivating factor for individual commissioners to express their opinions? I don't know if I have that answer. It, se it seems philosophical. Um, well, I mean, I mean you're talking about the code. It's it's the code, and there there are objective standards and there are subjective standards, and. Um, you know, you have to consider the staff report, you have to consider the the testimony that was given. Um, and, you know, just make, make that decision. Sometimes they're close calls. Um, and you guys aren't going to agree unanimously on everything. Um, but, you know, in, in Joy's case, being a realtor, and there's something that comes up, and um, should she feel motivated to express her decision? publicly or to the record. Um, you know, you mentioned in the 106, if, if 
you know, the, the attorney could come after her saying she's biased. And, but if she has made her opinions part of the record, I mean, is, is that a motivator for us to, to express that? Express your opinions on the application and how it fits within the code. And or I mean, the comp plan. Or the comp plan, right, which the code po points to the comp plan. Um, I don't think I'm answering your question. <laughs> well, I, I guess the question is, you know, individually or how much should we feel compelled to back up our vote? Uh, um, I think as much as you can, but using using the evidence that is in is in front of you um, that you have heard. Uh, and read in the packet. So, um, so saying something like, "Oh well, I own one of those," and you know, and referencing maybe what we're like a variance or something we're talking about, is that like a an example? I is that the example? Not right. Things, so like I'm just kind of giving an example. Don't rely on your personal experiences yeah. or deliberations. I think you want to talk, you know, go through the standards, um, you know, even just go through the list. Like we can put them up on the screen. Oftentimes you guys ask us to go, you know, scroll, scroll to the standards, scroll to the chart that Hannah put together. She loves charts. And, um, and, then, and then go through that and talk about each standard in turn. Um, you know, if it's something that we think is going to be, if it's something that's controversial, especially. All right. And public opinion is not grounds for denial or approval. Correct. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Just get ready for more. <laughs> okay. And we have a housing update. And I suspect that's Hannah my favorite topic, yours as well, <laughs> I hope. Um, Hannah Klausman, Community Development Director. I'll just pull up the presentation that I have. And um, I was taking the opportunity to do this. Um, let's see here. As we have some new commission members, um, Gregory actually attended um, one of the trainings that we had recently two weeks ago that community builders put on in regards to housing, and I thought it was just a good time to keep you all updated of the programs, which you have painstakingly reviewed over the years on how that's going. Um, maybe I'll share. Ta -da. <laughs> and also, um, I have some updates on some recent council discussions, which will include some items that will likely be coming down the pipeline to you guys. All right, so this is our affordable housing measures and progress report. Um, I included some of the slides here that has information from our 2019 regional housing needs assessment, which you all are fairly familiar with, and I will make sure to make this document available um, to everyone that's joined the commission. It had a lot of great information regarding uh, what Glenwood as as far as a housing gap, what, what um, residents need and what we have, and then where that gap is. So the charts that you're looking at here um, include our housing gap broken down by area median income levels. So you can see that that's less than 60% AMI all the way up through 160% AMI. Um, and I do have the chart to show you what those AMI numbers correspond to for people who aren't familiar with what an area median income is. Um, so you can see we've got the numbers with the projection from 2017, and then they also included an estimate for what they um, thought 2027 would be, given quite a few parameters. Um, and then it's illustrated on the side where um, the gap you can see is showing up in that yellow color based on where the AMI is. So in 2017, our greatest need, um, unsurprisingly, was below 100% AMI, uh, specifically in the 60 to 80% range. 
Um, and you can see those numbers changing slightly with their prediction for 2027. Um, the small figure on the bottom of your screen is we did a update actually the West Mountain Regional Housing Coalition of which Glenwood Springs is a member and I am a board member to that group. Um, we did an update on information to look at because we did this lovely 2019 housing needs assessment and then the world went a little wonky and everyone had the question of well what does it mean now. Um, so those figures indicate some of the factors that came through the pandemic that we think uh, we are fairly certain had a very large impact on some of these numbers, including um, a 42% increase in the median single family uh, home sale price that is representative for Garfield County. Um, so that 686,000 number, as you can guess, that's quite a bit higher in Glenwood Springs. Um, also average rent, this is specifically for Glenwood Springs, an increase of 42%. This is from 2019 to 2021. And then the thing that we would hope would keep up with those numbers to make that even out is average weekly wages, which you can see it did increase some, but 16% compared to those other items. So with that information um, and looking at the study from 2019, we uh, hypothesized that the 2027 numbers, it would be nice if we were there, but we're not. Those are far greater. The need has increased across the board and almost every area median income category. So a little doom and gloomy, <laughs> but um, sometimes that's how the housing discussion goes. So I wanted to remind you of what these numbers were with this um, assessment that we did, give you a little bit of background on how we think that was impacted, and then I'll go into something else, but I see a question. But, <clears throat> these are rental? Based this is on rental and for sale. The so do you you assume a certain percentage down and then a mortgage is the as opposed to a rental per month? Is that how those numbers equate or how does that work? So the assumption here with the area median income, whether it's for rent or for sale product ownership, is um, a house is considered a um, cost burdened if they're spending more than 30% of their gross income on housing costs. So that would apply for rent. And I think actually if I move to the next slide here, um, that would apply to if you're spending 30% on rent or if you're spending more than 30% on your mortgage on housing costs. Um, so this is the uh, Chapa and HUD haven't come out with 2023 numbers yet. They should be any day, which we are highly anticipating. Um, but this is your AMI category for Garfield County. We don't do specifically for Glenwood Springs. It is Garfield County. So this breaks down from 120% down to 20%. Um, what, and this is on the rental side. Um, so what the maximum rent, maximum affordable rent would be for individuals in those categories. Just to clarify, so these numbers, the 2017, those numbers, the less than 60 AMI, the 1,126, that was the need. Yes. That was and the, then 27, yeah. we're anticipating the need to be down to that 400 That's what they were number. anticipating. At the time, okay. Yes. And so the one that, gosh, yeah, there were a couple of categories that increased significantly. Boy, Okay. <laughs> So um, why I wanted to bring this, we get a lot of questions on, okay, so what have we built, right? How do the numbers that we've built factor into this needs assessment? And I included this, this is something that community development staff keeps up. So every time we have a project that comes through and gets your approval and gets city council's approval, whatever it needs, and then pulls a building permit, uh, this is where we keep that information. So we include unit types, um, if they were subject to inclusionary zoning or possibly have units in the voluntary program, total number of units, some other information about square footage and acreage, parking spaces, things that are very helpful for staff to be able to look back and, and know the exact details of a project. Um, and so you can see this is from 2016 to present. 2016, why we use that year is basically 2009 to 2000. 15 were, there was nothing to show here. <laughs> we weren't very busy and now we are incredibly busy. 
Um, so these are the projects that have received entitlement since 2016. So some of them are completed, some of them are just approved and haven't started yet, and some of them are under construction now, which you can see around town. And that total number of units is 1,179. And um, if you go through this with a fine tooth comb, you will see that most of these are for rent projects. There are a few um, in here that are for sale townhome projects. As we all know, we that's not as prevalent as the rental product due to several factors, including some construction liability defects legislation that we have in Colorado. Um, so then I, you know, I would call your attention to the inclusionary zoning and deed restricted column, which shows you um, whether, whether these projects have units that are deed restricted to 100% AMI. So they would be subject if they're a rental property to that maximum rent that I showed you previously, or if they're a for sale property, um, they actually have to set their for sale prices to 100% AMI uh, affordability. Um, looking at these, so we do have, some of these have come in before our inclusionary zoning program came online, so they weren't subject to it, so you won't see anything in that column. So that was something that um, PNZ and City Council moved forward in order to get some more affordable housing or attainable housing, I think is probably the better word for these um, housing units in Glenwood Springs. I will stop here since this is a lot of information to throw at you and ask if there are any questions on this spreadsheet. I have one. Where was the development behind Lowe's? Was that the loss phase four? Um, the I development it was... behind Lowe's is, uh, we refer to it as BLD. And so it's here. It's oh, the second okay. Line Meadows, I was looking for. Okay, perfect. Lofts phase four is actually right next to Lofts phase three, which that doesn't mean much, <laughs> off of East Meadows and has been approved but not constructed yet. So it's a smaller building. And is that building that they're, they have built right now, is that the child care facility? That the, the building that's currently covered in green Tyvek yes. material? Um, no, that is a separate um, commercial project that was approved oh. for... Um, Recreational marijuana retail location. Okay. What, what's the name of the one that's out behind the uh, auto dealership in West Glenwood? Uh, that one is Mountain View Flats. Um, and these are actually, I ordered these, they used to be by year that they came in. Um, but for reference, we put these in units per acre to give you an idea of density, the types of density that has come in with these units. So that's this. Um, light blue highlighted column. So you can see um, the duplexes, Oasis Creek duplexes, um, they're at 3.5 units per acre, and this goes all the way up um, to 220. And a good thing to remember for this is that that equation is literally the land, um, the parcel that the property is being built on with the number of units. So Western Hotel, as you can see, is down here with 220. It's a very small project but it is built lot line to lot line and straight up. Mm -hmm. So that density represents uh, a lot higher. But so in, in reviewing that column, you can also take a look at the types of projects and it will have a different feel. Was there a reason there's two tables in here? What was the um, difference between? Human error. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, what is the difference? Kind of working at 9 p.m. at night and forgetting to delete one that I didn't like the color of. Oh. <laughs> They like the purple. <laughs> um, and we can continue, we can come back to this if you'd like, um, but wanted to give you an update on that. And then the final comment on this in looking at 1,179 units, what we get a lot when we go back to this, Glenwood Springs need was estimated to be about 2,000 unit shortfall. So what staff hears on a frequent basis is, great job, you solved it. You built 1,179 units, so we're good. Um, unfortunately, most of those 1,179 units, you can imagine where they fall along this spectrum, and they're going to be above 120% AMI. It's not that there isn't need in those categories as well, it's just not our greatest need area. So while we have, developers have built projects and added to the housing stock of Glenwood, it doesn't always necessarily correlate to these need categories. Karen. Are we thinking that the people who are making less than 60% AMI are 
going to start making more or are they leaving town? Like how did that 1100 number drop so significantly when we have not provided any housing in that price range? That is a very interesting question that I am unable to answer. And you have to call up the consultants that did this. They Keep might mind. have been driven out of town. There were a lot right. of, <laughs> and I think it's actually, if we go back to the appendix of the document, they mm -hmm. they state the some of the assumptions um, that were used in these um, equations. But there was numerous. Yeah, and, and it seems as though we had a pretty good grip on the, you know, 100% and above, but we're planning on building a whole lot more of that. So I th I guess my comment is this this graph makes me wonder how well balanced we are in directing development perhaps some of these Excellent things comment. are out of our hands <laughs> well that's why we're talking about it tonight i suppose um okay um, i had a, i had a question too so so one was you mentioned earlier that it was based on you know the typical bank thing that you're 30 percent of your income you know your which probably most people around here, 50 to 60% of their income, you know, if you're at the Meadows or some of those places. So does that, does that play into some of the, of, of, of how people live here that, you know, are in the 60%, but they're spending a heck of a lot more? Sure. And, and another component of that study um, that I didn't include here, but they looked at the percentage of cost burdened households in the region and in areas and um, using very fancy economics and math came to um, the estimate that the cost burden households in the region cost the area approximately $54 million annually in lost revenue. Um, basically, a household's ability to purchase things or have disposable income goes down when they're spending 40, 50, 60% on their housing. They literally, quite literally can't do much else. Right. Um, so that, that's an economic factor that was represented as well. And then, and then one, one other question I have, because I think, I mean, this is, this is awesome. This is great information. And, uh, and it would be nice if, if it could be part of maybe staff reports when, when it's, um, you know, we have, yeah, projects coming up now and then that 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 it just kind of says here's where this falls in, here's kind of the need, because it's kind of it's it's a very data driven kind of thing, and you know you could question the assumptions or whatever, but this this is what it is, and I think it's a it's very good to help us understand here's how this fits into the picture as a whole, and certainly with the passage of the two C the affordable housing tax um, in November, um, you know there's going to be a lot more reporting and a lot more tracking of how those funds are spent and which projects they are going to and the numbers involved in these. Um, so I anticipate providing this lovely presentation to you more frequently or possibly telling Watkins to present to you. <laughs> do, do we know what percentage of uh, households in our region are living uh, in excess of that 30% uh, affordability. Yeah. Um, we did have some updated information on that, um, and the number was standing at about forty percent. And I believe so. There's some different. That was the average between rental and home ownership. But there's some differences there that I can't quite recall. But forty percent of the population. So that's significant. Thirty percent. Thirty percent. Um, I recently was at the housing summit. I was a presenter at the housing summit in Aspen, and there was a very um, prudent comment that was made to the entire room of 350 people. And it was, if you had to basically redo your housing situation now, meaning if you had to purchase your home now at its value now, or you had to rent at the maximum, would you be able to do it? And the number of hands that were kind of half raising and then got put down with just this kind of shocked face. It was a very interesting realization for a lot of people. So bringing it home. Um, but we have lots of other stuff to review. So um, I wanted to give you guys just a quick update and also to new members to talk about all the wonderful work that you have done to get us to where we are. Um, so this is just a list of years of the code changes that we've done. We had a complete development code rewrite, which helped with several items regarding parking reductions and things of that, bringing it a little bit more in line. 
Um, the vacation rentals, um, we changed that entirely. We have limits. I'll talk about that in a second. We rewrote accessory dwelling units together. Look at all these like fond memories we have. <laughs> I should have fun pictures. Um, inclusionary zoning, that came back in 2021. So that's where you saw that column where we have deed restricted units that are required for any um, project over 10 units, that is. Um, the affordable housing tax that passed. West Mountain Regional Housing Coalition is a new nonprofit that we're a member of, and they're doing active work to cover the gaps that we can't do as a municipality, but need addressing on a regional scale. Um, we have Habitat for Humanity project, um, and a memorandum of understanding with them for two sites. And we most recently with city council and you guys um, updated our inclusionary housing with that small tweak um, where rental products are now at 20% requirement, where for sale product is at 10% requirement. And then on the horizon, um, community development staff is actively working on our strategic housing plan update that we have a grant for. Um, and that will be coming to you in the next couple months for review and action. Um, the rest of the slides, which are in your packet, so I won't take a lot of time here, just basically updates you on where these programs are at. Our voluntary program, which is one where um, you're not required to do it, but if someone wants to come in and they see that waiving the system improvement fees um, would be beneficial to them, they enter into an agreement with us to deed restrict it to 100% AMI for rent. Um, and we have currently 45, and today might be 46 um, units in that program. They also include some employers, Iron Mountain Hot Springs and Rolling Fork School District, which are in that program. Um, the development code rewrite, as I mentioned, what that did, I have two examples here, old code, new code, as far as our parking standards go, and this is a contentious topic as always. Um, but during that development code rewrite, what our consultants found to be a little bit more in line with national trends as well as the state of Colorado, we actually lowered the threshold for what we require per unit parking spaces, which used to be 2.4. Um, and now it's 1.7 with some flexibility to get a further reduction if you prove certain criteria, such as free bus passes, access to transit, shared parking, a number of things that can get you further down. And I won't, I won't comment any further on that. You guys probably have your own opinions. So um, that was something out of that that made development or at least housing units a little bit easier to do. Um, vacation rentals, um, this is just a quick update. You can see from the last time I gave you an update in 2022, um, we are creeping back up a little bit on those permit numbers, but we're far below the thresholds that were set. And what we're seeing on that, because there was a 250 foot buffer and permits don't transfer, that that number kind of fluctuates and doesn't, doesn't go up dramatically. Um, and we were very well positioned with that code for the pandemic, as we've seen neighboring counties and jurisdictions really struggle and end up with a problem that is a little bit too far gone to rein it back in. Um, so you can see right now we're up to 120 total permits um, as of yesterday. Accessory Adam, dwelling units. Adam, we, could, you, yes. could you elaborate on what you said about other communities and their experiences and difficulties? Um, sure, and you know, as planners, we we get together and we chat and we talk about all of our problems. <laughs> and one of them is vacation rentals. Um, so Summit County is a great example and some of the ski resort areas that didn't have regulations in place. And what they saw happen during the pandemic was a skyrocketing of the number of short-term rental permits um, and vacation homes that were converted from, you know, could have been a rental or long-term housing into a short-term housing. And I forget, um, I was just watching a presentation for Summit County, but the percent of their housing units that are vacation rentals is staggering. And it's above, I wanna say it's above 30%, but don't quote me on that. So imagine if 30% of your housing stock was not being used for long-term housing. Mm -hmm. It makes it that much more difficult for anyone who works here to actually find a place to rent or to buy. So they're dealing with a problem that got quickly exacerbated by the pandemic of people moving to mountain towns and purchasing a second home and then quickly turning it into a vacation rental. Are and they the, still on a, they were on a moratorium, weren't they? Big M word. Yeah. Um, 
I can't recall, but I know yeah. that was being tossed around by several jurisdictions. And that's what happens when you feel that a problem has gotten too big, that you actually need to put a moratorium on it, like Glenwood did um, with our vacation rentals, enable to, to enable staff to put together some policy decisions to try and mitigate. And they haven't figured out how to bring that, reel that back in, I guess. It, I mean, once it's out there, it's very hard to claw Harder, back. Yeah. yeah, as you guys can probably recall, ours wasn't pretty. And we were dealing with, you know, 200 permits. Yeah. Great question. Um, <laughs> accessory dwelling units, we tweaked the code there, going bigger, uh, more flexible with setbacks and things of that nature. We have a ADU bingo card in community development. So every time one of the tweaks that we made to the code, some ADU comes in and is allowed that would have been prohibited, we mark our bingo card. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so that, that was a great, you know, I think we still have some room to explore other ideas there. Um, you know, I said on the horizon concept review of allowing more than one ADU on a lot. Those are things that you guys talked about that we just haven't gotten back to yet. It's junior, junior, oh, yeah. Ju junior, ADUs, junior and senior, um, inclusionary zoning. I just mentioned, we recently tweaked that with you guys who are a big part of that. Um, and so the final item tonight, which was brought up at city council um, on Thursday, and I was directed to start this conversation with planning and zoning and see if this is something that we need to include in a possible code update. So we're talking about housing diversity. And in our code, section 704080, which is our residential site and building design, we have this section of code that requires a residential project that comes in that is over three acres to provide a minimum of two of the housing types from that list. And if it's over six acres, then they are required to provide three of those housing types. Um, I believe you guys have sat in on a project um, that had this recently. And this was something in our old code pre-2018 um, that we handed out variances for a lot. So we do have a lot of examples in town where developments occurred where they um, applied for a variance and were granted a variance so that they did not have to do this particular section of code. With the 2018 rewrite and your guys' other favorite topic, variances, and how we've kind of reined that in and tried to make the code more flexible in some ways, but made requesting and getting a variance a little bit more challenging, improving the hardship. We have had developments that are subject to this section of code that have had to provide it, um, an example being 100 apartment units um, with a duplex on the site. So that's two housing types. Oh. So they met, they met the code, right? This is what staff brought forward. It met the standard. But not the intent. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's, we'll, we'll talk about intent. Um, so this is what we're looking at now. And an interesting thing that staff has discovered is that this is in our residential site and building design. So this applies to residential projects. If by chance you are doing a mixed use project, um, then this does not apply because it's not in our section of code that is mixed use and commercial site and building design. Um, and that might be something for discussion to evaluate the intent of why that wasn't included there and if it needs to be added. And we can postulate on intent, but you know, mixed use components there it that is combining a commercial and a residential use so it might have been well if they're doing that that's kind of already meeting a variety type and so maybe it's not necessary but that might be something that needs to be reviewed um so i'm throwing this out to you guys as a um first blush if you will on thoughts and possible direction on what you feel about this particular section of code as staff begins to review it at city council's direction. And that is the end of my <laughs> housing progress report. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Um, so if you have comments on this, um, staff will be working on it. I'm not expecting you guys to draft code right now. Um, so what? So what's your take on it? I mean. To me, it seems like, you know, why wouldn't you have that conversation and go through that, especially with what we have that, I mean, what, what does staff think about that? 
Sure, and, and this is something that's come up, I think, at PNZ and City Council in discussions, but it's never been brought forward for an actual code review. My take on it is, like with all things with housing, it is incredibly complicated and nuanced, and what we have to be very careful about in, in drafting code policy is it can have far-reaching implications on what that means for development in the city, which is kind of the intent, but really thinking through where the impacts might be felt. And that can take, you know, that's, that's a heavy lift for staff. We wanna look at other codes, what other municipalities are doing and have a chat with them of what, what has this resulted in? Um, you know, we talk about tweaking requirements if they're regulatory and how that might impact development happening at all or a certain type of development only coming in. You know, I think when you look at the construction defects liability, there is a lot of unforeseen implications that have been far reaching to this point. And that's certainly what we don't want to do too much um, as much as we can see into the crystal ball of how things are going to turn out. So I think there are some low hanging fruit items here, possibly adding that back in on the mixed use site. If we take a look at that and think for these larger projects, even if they are mixed use, we'd still like to see some different varieties of housing types. Um, so well, um, the four comp plan, you know, cause comp plan took a lot of time, but we were doing work sessions now and then. I mean, would this be something that could be a work? Cause it, I mean, it seems like it's worthwhile talking about but I, I agree with what you said, who knows what the consequences are. So you, you need to decide how much time you wanna go down a rat hole on it or do that. I mean, is there is there any thought of, I don't know, you, you guys don't have any time probably for doing work sessions or whatnot, but I mean, is that, would this be that kind of conversation that, you know, where we could just have a, where we could just talk about it, not. It could certainly be added um as a work session component i think this is something that council has as i mentioned has talked about several times and and this is sometimes how policy goes right you think about it you mention it you know back in 2021 and it gets brought up anecdotally in 2022 2023 we need it now yeah. <laughs> right yeah. suddenly the timeline has been sped up significantly mm -hmm. um so we're, staff is working with legal at council's direction to see you know, a desired timeline and then also provide feedback on a feasible timeline because those can be two different things. Um, but I would certainly really like the opportunity to have a work session uh, with, with you guys. Has any municipality been, because we talk, I mean, that's a variety of just aesthetically different looking types of, of housing. I know we talk a lot about homeownership versus investor-owned rentals. Has there ever been any municipality that's been successful in somehow adding that into code, st making stipulations that some units need to be for sale? Um, just because we see this hugely disproportionate amount of multifamily um units that are being rented that really creates certain type of housing, but not a variety of housing. Um, has anyone been successful? I mean, <laughs> excellent and probing question, Commissioner White. Um, because it would have to be in code somehow for us to, to other than <laughs> bringing up the comp, the comp plan as our guiding, um, you know, our North Star in trying to force that or prove that we want that as a city. Yeah. But it's it's hugely disproportionate, right? I mean, yes, would you agree? As the spreadsheet that I keep yes. reminds me of on a daily basis. And we um, have no tools to Yes. And I, I would say what I see more often is um, the carrot dangle. The carrot. Yeah. Which right? Which is less complicated because absolutely it's, it's getting them to come to you and trying to entice. And you guys had this exact conversation when we looked at inclusionary zoning you tweaked what staff brought before you because you certainly didn't want to unnecessarily cost burden a for sale product. So right. it didn't come. So this is always that give and take. I think a lot of jurisdictions and Richard could probably speak to this as um, the law firm represents quite a few uh, jurisdictions that are very similar to us in our housing prices. Um, 
I haven't seen a lot and I'm not exactly sure on the legal nuances of a requirement for a for sale product. Right. And, and maybe then we just need to see an example of some of the carrots that are being offered in other municipalities. Um, certainly something that staff would want to go for yeah. and find, yes. I think that would be helpful. Um, I, I was gonna say, we, I have not seen this concept <coughs> put into code from a uh, regulatory standpoint. Um, yeah, I, I think we have researched this at some point, but I, I think there are property rights implications that go go beyond, you know, local government police power control, which is what kind of the land use regulations are based in, whereas this is, um, it goes beyond the health, safety, and welfare of the community. Right, right. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, Richard. Um, and I would just say to that, you know, I think you guys are fully aware that staff takes opportunities to update code when we see issues come about fairly frequently. And so this is no different. You know, we might be able to see some of those low hanging fruit options that are not as complicated um, and go after that first with the caveat of staff will continue to look at these other options that, that really do take more time in the research and in presenting to you guys pros and cons. And this is just a side side note. I think the housing, um, the regional housing nonprofit that you're involved in should somehow address how the Colorado defects law is affecting housing. And maybe there needs to be lobbying on some level to either provide better insurance for these, these you know, contractors or somehow mitigate the problem. <laughs> I'll get right along. Pass that on to them. We'll solve that on Tuesday. Thank you, Hannah. Good job. Great as always. Good job. So we have commissioner comments. Start with Amy. Thank you. Well, I'm pretty excited to see where the city's going to go after we've had this big change up in community development and in council, and we've got new liaison. So um, I'm feeling pretty hopeful about the future, uh, and it, it feels more like we're out of COVID now. Um, and then I have been keeping a list of a few items that I would like to address in future meetings about um, code items, and one of the big ones is a dark sky um, regulations or requirements for shielded light fixtures. So if you want me to email you and we'll put that on a list and talk about it somewhere down the line. I um, have fielded some community support for said regulations. Thanks. Um, the one thing I would like to hear when you do your little spiel and would be with, with the new city manager coming on board and what's kind of the I mean, is, is there any changes in city staff or is that, what's, yeah, okay. <laughs> this is okay. Um, that's very pertinent. Um, yes, we do have some new city staff. We actually just sent out some announcements today. So our new city engineer started today. Uh, Ryan Gordon has filled that position. Um, so this was his first day of drinking from the fire hose. So stop by and say hi. Um, he's on the second floor opposite from community development. So what, what, what is his job? He is, his title is city engineer. Terry Parks, yeah. so, so he took Terry's job. Yes. I'm trying to think of the other positions. If they come to me, I will. Yeah. Assistant. There is a new fire marshal. Yes, Robin um, Pitt. Yes, he has started. He's already hit the ground running after Greg Bach um, left the position. So he's working with community development on all things fire. Anyone else, Carolyn? <laughs> and of course, our new city manager, which if you haven't had the pleasure of meeting, um, <laughs> she's making the rounds in the community as well. Thank you. 
Oh boy. Um, we also have a new Parks and Recreation Director, Rod Trujillo. Um, I believe he started maybe a couple weeks ago and he's also drinking from the fire hose so you might not see these people for a while, mm -hmm. but a lot of new faces. And we have some positions upcoming as well and I'll update you at the next meeting on those people. Okay. April. Yeah, um, thanks as always for a great presentation. I really appreciated the quasi-judicial proceedings um, reminder, especially with some big stuff coming down the pipeline this year. Um, I think all of that info was really topical. So thanks. Did, did any sort of traffic study get updated in town? Or when was the last, do we know when the last traffic study was done? You know, I'd have to check in with engineering. Terry was working on some of those updates. And I believe at her last city council meeting, she was discussing some data there. Um, but let me check in with our new city engineer. I'm sure he will have the answer. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Soon anyways. <laughs> um, let me check in with them and see if we have any updated data. Are you asking because you'd like to see it or? Yeah, I just feel like it would be helpful for us to maybe even just have like a overview of how it works. Um, I don't, I don't know what what the means of rolling that out would be, but I just feel like with some of these applications that we may see, we will want to just kind of under really understand how those traffic reports work. And I'm sorry if I talked a lot tonight. <laughs> I'm not sorry. Fake, apo I, I'm a fake, fake apology. Fake apology. <laughs> yeah. You let her have the time. Yeah, you get cool in your comments. Thanks all. Great job as always. <laughs> job. Um, well, I think the dark sky idea is great. I wish our street lights on Midland would apply, would would follow that because the lights clear down to the river, and I can't imagine how that's beneficial for wildlife and such, but uh, I like to get on my high horse on some things and that's one of them. Um, at our meeting when when city council was interviewing um, new applicants for planning and zoning, um, our now mayors mentioned that there was perhaps training um, funds available for uh, commissioners to, um, and she had mentioned uh, after that, that she had gone to a training session that was all about uh, land planning and land use that was really beneficial. And um, do we know anything about that? Uh, what might be available, what funds and what offerings? Yeah, we did have some funding set aside at city council's discretion for planning and zoning commissioners to attend trainings. And I believe, um, former Commissioner Weimer, and as well as Commissioner Waller attended uh, one that I sent out, Rocky Mountain Land Use Institute. Um, there was a day on water resources and other. So we do have opportunities. If you guys find something that you're interested in that is applicable to your um, duties as assigned and you're interested in training, please do reach out. Um, I now hold the keys to that so we can... <laughs> We can find applicable find trainings um, for you guys to go to. Um, I think you you let us know about that. I mean, that I was, did. That, that was the the planning thing or whatever it was. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you sent a note out to us for that. Once again, I was not on the list. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to say anything. Apologies. Mm -hmm. So we do have, there are planning conferences that happen annually. Um, Rum Louie, Rocky Mountain Land Use Institute, which is a good one, happens in the spring. Uh, Colorado APA is another one that happens in the fall. Um, so there are recurring opportunities and when their um, schedules come out and I see, I will definitely try and keep you all in mind. And then if you see something that you're interested in that you think applies, um, send it my way and we can talk about it. Okay, thanks. Um, director's comments. Okay. Um, so Mitchell didn't actually get a chance to say bye to the commission, but he did hand in his resignation as he's moved on to bigger 
and better things. Um, so just like to thank Mitchell for his service on Planning and Zoning Commission and congratulate him on his election to city council. Um, we do have quite a few applications coming down the lane. Um, they shift around, but we will have um, likely a strategic housing plan update for you at the May meeting, um, as well as some possible sign variances. So exciting. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and then right on the heels of that, we have quite a few applications um, that are in the works. And so just as a um, reminder, I may have to send an email out for an additional meeting um, to try and schedule so that we can get at least a quorum um, because we can't, you can't, none of us can in this room, review eight applications in a meeting. Um, so sometimes that's what it's looking like. Sometimes it, you know, things move around and they kind of spread out, but um, we are kind of looking at that as we head into the summer season. So just be prepared for that request. And then also, you know, now that the comprehensive plan has been adopted, um, we can get back to holding work sessions. I know that was something that you all are very interested in. We have a lot of topics to talk about. So we may look at trying to schedule with you guys, um, get some work sessions on the books. Maybe it's every other month um, where we can talk about some of these topics ahead of the timeline getting very tight and needing to move fast. That's all I've got. Okay, thank you. Well, then, we're adjourned.